any challenges, any opportunities you'd like to highlight in your career? Um, so if, if I may, um, can I speak about, uh, you know, what is entailed when you are sitting on top as a fighter controller? Like what, are, what, what do you have to understand and learn? Absolutely. So what happens is uh, because you're sitting over there and you are supposed to, you know, negotiate and navigate the, your forces safely away from the adversaries, as a fighter controller, you get to study and you get to imbibe as, you know, knowledge, you know, strength and capabilities of your own systems and fleets strength and cap capabilities of the advers adversary system and fleets. You know, what type of weapon he's using, what is the aircraft he's using, what is the ground weapon station he's using. And that's a no lot of knowledge that you have to learn. And um, uh, you need to understand and study, you know, uh, not only its capability, but also you need to apply this into tactics. And those tactics now become, you know, life and death. It is how you save your own from the adversary employing these capabilities and understandings of strengths and weaknesses into tactics that now ensure that you are you know ensuring your mission objective is met and with as safety as numbers as possible yes i think and this is a point which has also been highlighted by a marshal uh, vps rana whom yes. i had a conversation with and he did mention in so many words that yes, you know, as a fighter controller, firstly, of course, it's a learning experience. You know, you've got to be um, knowing everything, right? And the kind of exposure you get uh, as far as the air battle is concerned, uh, comprehensive as it can get. I mean, if there's anybody who is uh, in the Air Force, we can who knows uh, about all the air battle, etc. picture, I think it, a fighter controller would rank probably right in the front. We've all uh, been a party to it and things are getting more uh, sophisticated with the technology uh, coming to our aid. Yes, so uh, you did mention that you know, we, are, uh, we have embarked on this AWC uh, yes. of uh, in, um, our own you know, Make in India thing. And Having uh, seen this evacs operating, of course, with the uh, alongside the western border, now we do have a lot of border opening up as far the north is also concerned. I keep reading this um, in the media. You know that you know we are wanting to have more and more evacs. Right, we are not really in a position to have round the clock surveillance as far the evacs are concerned, covering all the. Uh, this thing. Are we looking at uh, augmenting uh, these EVAX fleet, EVAX fleet? The EVAX is a system that uh, gives you all packages which you're looking for in one. It's like a very good, you know, I wouldn't say it's a not a correct comparison, but say it's a, a good system which gives you uh, com comparatively everything in one package. You have offensive, defensive, uh, surveillance, all capabilities. Now, um, to look at costs, as you mentioned, and look at efficiency of those costs and to optimize it. I mentioned something known as a sensor network or a sensor grid. So you have ground-based systems, that is the radars, uh, and you know you have radars that move closer to the border, like the ones which you commanded. And then uh, you also have something known as aerostats. So basically, these are uh, radars which are mounted on top of a balloon. Okay. Now, they also have their strengths and they also have the limitations. And then you have the AVACs and the AWNC. So uh, what um, government would do is to optimize its budget and within the means of that, look at operational capability and thereafter ensure that you have round the clock surveillance okay, uh, to ensure that you are able to detect uh, the adversary's actions way before it forms a threat. Now, this could also include information from satellites. Yes. So satellites need no rest. And then uh, to... Uh, from, a, from a strategic level, as we come down to a tactical level, now you have the AVAX capable of being launched at that particular point in time when you expect that the adversary would, you know, uh, initialize its action and, you know, and we have to take precautionary measures. Okay. So, yes, I mean, it's a, a network of all the sensors, you know, I yes. think which will uh, definitely be used and... Um, now, uh, you did mention about the UAVs. Yeah, so a little word on the UAVs as far as, you know, as a fighter controller or as a service, uh, there's a lot of talk of, you know, the drones in the UAVs these days. Whatever you can say about it. 
So, sir, in the military domain, uh, the UAVs have been a game changer, as you have seen. Uh, you know, in the recent conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, okay, mm. uh, uh, and uh, currently what's happening in uh, Ukraine and uh, versus Russia, and um, uh, well before that, you know, uh, terror again, uh, fighting the terror against ISIS. Mm-hmm. Uh, UAVs started off as toys in the you know hobby industry. And suddenly, uh, non-conventional capability of forces, you know, that is, uh, armies started using these toys like DJI, UAVs, etc. You know, they can strap on a grenade and mm. put a shuttlecock on top of that grenade to stabilize the flight of the grenade as it drops and, you know, pinpoint the accuracy of the grenade onto the forces. Okay. Now, how effective that is, that's a separate question and we'll not talk about that here. Mm-hmm. But uh, from that, all the way to utilizing UAVs, in a sophisticated manner, the manner in which, you know, air forces like the USAF uh, utilize the UAVs, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the spectrum is very large because today technology has reached a level in which uh, a hobby grade UAV flies Mm -hmm. autonomously. For example, you know, you can with hand gestures, make sure that the UAV follows you. Mm -hmm. That is what is available in the hobby grade. Now, if you want to misuse that or better utilize it, in an optimal way, uh, you know, it is possible. And so with that small level of benchmark, all the way to the, you know, Global Hawk and Predator and uh, Reaper series of the, uh, what's going on, uh, you know, with the, uh, in the USAP, all the way to the uh, Bayraktar series of the Turkish, uh, you know, UAV, which is uh, very prominently used by Russia, etc against Ukraine and Ukraine also use using, you know, so many UAVs against Russia. These become low cost hmm. capability to, uh, you know, uh, utilize this as a weapons platform and inflict some sort of damage to the enemy. Now, this is on the war front. Yes. But uh, on the domestic front, uh, what happens is UAVs have a lot of role, like they can be used to carry loads and, you know, they can be used to uh, deliver. You could have heard, mm-hmm. Yes, you could have heard about delivery, etc. And uh, so the UAV, UAV technology is, you know, technology is growing and making UAVs more independent and autonomous. Mm-hmm. And uh, therefore it is getting safer to use UAVs in amongst public rather than just having it in a place with, uh, you know, uh, as a hobby. Absolutely. No, we, we do talk of, you know, um, pursuing hobbies and these days, uh, the present generation of the youngsters and the ones who are going to follow, you know, they're uh, totally, you know, uh, techy, very, very tech savvy and, uh, you know, um, those game savvies, you know, controlling those uh, UAVs or drones and things like that. I, I did listen to one of the talks by uh, the GOC in C training command, you know, Lieutenant General Shukla, where, you know, he was, I think he was giving some talk in uh, some university where he did mention that, you know, in future, we go to have more and more technical guys, you know, coming into the service as specialists. And uh, though we do have uh, those, um, you know, requirements of serving, you know, uh, fulfilling the criteria of uh, being an officer and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But he did indicate that, yes, you know, uh, considering the kind of expertise that the youngsters have today, uh, there may be a case for inducting these people on short term project kind of a basis. And um, I, I think uh, sooner or later, we're going to have that. We we may not see them as, you know, full-fledged officers or something. But the, you use the uh, term, you know, weapons um, or, or weapons control or something. What, what is that? Weapons director or air battle managers. Yeah, air battle manager. Or something to that effect, you know, where they're able to uh, maneuver these uh, drones and UAVs. So that expertise, I'm sure, you know, a uh, lot of people have developed this as, as a hobby. And uh, yes, you know, the usage in the civil as well as extended use in the uh, military. I think uh, at least I see this as coming sooner than later. So uh, you're mentioning about specialists. Uh, so this is another thing which the fighter controlling branch, you know, um, uh, gives you an option. Hmm. So uh, once you join any service, what happens is how you grow in that service depends upon your capability and ability. Yes. So the beautiful thing about the fighter controlling uh, branch is that 
though it says fighter controlling it has a gamut of avenues below it so uh, as a specialist for example let's take my uh, my role itself as a fighter controller now i uh, had exposure towards uh, communication intelligence mm -hmm. and you know i was one of the very first instructors to uh, uh, fo formulate you know sops etc in you know uh, communication jamming and anti jamming which was also an airborne platform Yes. So, you know, but when you get into that, you need to study about it. Absolutely. So it wasn't your parent, uh, you know, branch. And then, but the Air Force gives you the opportunity to, you know, uh, do well in that and then, you know, propagate that particular thing. Thereafter, uh, we got exposure to, um, after joining the AVAX, I got exposure to a number of systems because the AVAX has got system of system, communication, electronics, mm -hmm. you know, navigation, uh, GPS. There are so many things on board. Now, what happens is you need to understand it to use it effectively and also to say problem shoot in case hmm. nothing hmm. is perfect. There are certain problems which happen. So you need to problem shoot that. So now what happens is you become a short term specialist during that time because you're flying, you know, missions that are long endurance, you know, greater than so many hours on board. Yes. You cannot carry engineers on with you. You've got only the operations crew. Yes. So it then again exposes you towards learning and new le learnings. And all these learnings come together and help you as an individual to later on, you know, uh, become rounded as a professional. And uh, that also helps you, like in my case, I have left the Air Force now, but it also helps you find, you know, uh, options outside to, you know, utilize uh, this knowledge in the civilian and, you know, in the domain where commercial domain, uh, you know, where you could probably guide companies to achieve their role. So this is another beauty of, you know, the fighter controlling branch, which um, expands your horizon and helps you, uh, you know, be ready and technologically savvy today. Indeed, I think that's a very, um, uh, very well articulated advantages, you know, uh, of being a fighter controller. So anything yes. you would like to tell the youngsters or the aspirants, you know, uh, initially, they are just saying, you know, they're joining ground duties, Adam branch. But yes, what happens after that? What are the possibilities? Why should they join, uh, you know, maybe a fighter controller uh, substream? Yes, sir. So um, I have also had an exposure as Adam officer. Like hmm. I have, it's part of my resume. And the interesting thing about Adam officer is that, you know, you get uh, from ground defense you know, weapons, uh, guns, etc., to defending that particular administrative unit, which, you know, from the enemies on the ground, mm. to all the way licensing with, you know, the people who are looking after the defense of the air uh, and ensuring that, you know, infrastructure is adequate and building those infrastructure. You get a host of specialized activities which you can learn administratively. Thereafter, I'm also a graduate of the Air Force Intelligence and uh, Security School, where uh, again merit based, you do the provost course, where mm -hmm. you you know you uh, to have crime, criminal investigation, uh, you know investigation of anything which is unnatural, yes. and uh, that course is also beautiful. It uh, exposes you to uh, various uh, capabilities of you know your uh, sister services or you know whose core duty like the police etc. in investigation of crimes. Mm -hmm. And how to deal with, you know, laws and criminal procedure, CRPC and all that uh, kind of, you know, uh, duties and policies. And uh, as you grow, uh, you also have an option of being exposed to what I've already told you, you know, warfare and operations capability. And at some point in life, you would be posted at a policy making body at the air headquarters, as we call it. And now you could be posted at a command level, which would be at the regional level, where you make policy at a regional level. And you could be posted at the national level at air headquarters, where you make policy at the national level. Now, whether it is flexible use of airspace, you know, in collaboration with Ministry of Civil Aviation, or it is about these countering, you know, threats from UAVs with Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, you have an option and exposure to this wide variety of, uh, you know, subjects, where with your background, as an officer in Indian Air Force, in the administration branch, in the as a fighter controller, you are able to choose a subject and uh, probably influence that in terms of policy and serve the nation in that way. So I think it's one of the very good options and avenues for somebody who is looking to serve 
and at the same time along with job satisfaction you know you're getting paid for it so Absolutely. i mean i think it's 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 uh, it's something which uh, everybody would aspire to be yes you know those those things are always there you know the kind of you know benefits the quality of life the opportunities you no know, uh, games sports adventures the kind of different uh, opportunities you have like you mentioned you know doing these specialized courses so it it definitely enriches you and you know by the time uh, you decide to um, i mean you superannuate or you decide to uh you know take a premature uh, retirement i mean these things they stand uh, they stand very well you know for uh, you in uh, stand in a good stead and so not to mention the excellent uh, human connection and human beings you meet along the way like you and everybody else and the mentors which you get like you sir. i mean it is amazing it helps uh, you know there there are people like you who help shape careers like mine you know that is how i look at it that that is i think very um, um nice of you to you know <laughs> talk on those uh, in those terms but yeah you know the, these are you know uh, as seniors you know we pass on our experience uh, yes. to the that is how uh, the armed forces in a very unique way you know they nurture the talent you know they yes. nurture the new generation yes. and i'm sure you no know, uh, in your life you know you would have uh, been so uh, beneficial to so many youngsters you no know? uh, they must be looking up to you and uh, so um, adarsh it's been uh, wonderful uh, interacting with you and i'm sure a uh, lot of viewers lot of aspirants uh, who are wanting to join uh, the air force uh, would definitely uh, look at it as a, a viable or a, a very beneficial option i started this whole series because i found that there was you know lack of this awareness you know um, particularly about certain branches you know we, we don't have much of awareness in the public domain that's it uh, thank you very much for your uh, valuable time and uh, let me also wish you the very best in your future endeavors i'm thank you sir uh, i'm sure you know you're doing pretty well and uh, may you do still better so thank you very much and jai hind it's a been a privilege and a pleasure sir thank you very much sir jai hind thank you